Once again, here we are at Crescent Moon. Do you remember Crescent Moon? Did I wake anybody up on that one? From 2002 until about 2010, I hung out at Crescent Moon weekly. Now I'm here, Crescent Moon, safe to say, and glad to say. Crescent Moon on Monday nights is still going with Jeff Martinson. We have a great poetry community that goes all the way, I guess, from here to Council Bluffs, and we even have one person here from New York tonight. Miss Svoda is here, so that's a great thing. We're having fun with that. I'm glad you all could come. What helps a lot, I guess, is clear roads. We've gotten used to the fact that it's cold and you found the heater button in your car, so everything is fine. And if you have electric heated seats, you're really doing too well. So t turn those things off, as far as that goes. I'm really glad to see all of you here tonight. We have a lot of readers. We have a lot of people that have come in to see what's going on and listen for a while. We'll be here two plus hours to read. Everyone gets about five or six minutes, and then the hook comes out. <laughs> five or six minutes sounds like just a little bit of time, but the idea is to everyone kind of throw in uh, one more skein in the rug. We're making some kind of an ornamental rug that, that eventually spells out 2018, one book, one Nebraska. Nebraska Presents Poetry Anthology. Yeah! We love that idea. Uh, Greg Kosminski uh, phoned in his regrets. He is sick tonight, and I know he is sick because he has two people here that would have carried him bodily if it would have been in any better shape at all. Greg is not here, but of course Mary Kay, our dear Mary Kay Stillweller is here to talk about the book that came out 10 years ago and now all of a sudden has popped up on the radar again. So I'm going to invite Mary Kay up to talk about the book a little bit, and then we'll get rolling with readers in the order that you see them on the sheet if they are here. Is that complex? No, that's pretty easy. So without further ado, Mary Kay Stillwell. Well, I don't know what to say except holy mackerel. You know? <laughs> It's so wonderful to look out and see your faces. Um, all of you folks, many of you folks are in the book, uh, and so you're, we're all just happy to be able to celebrate with Rex. And where did Rex go? Oh, thank you so much. Let's put it together. This is our first official function. Um, and celebration of one book, one Nebraska. And thanks to those wonderful, astute judges who judged Nebraska Presence, the, an anthology of poetry, to be our one book, one Nebraska this year. It took them 10 years, but damn it, they got it right, <laughs> finally. Um, the web page is up. Some of you may have uh, seen it already. Not all the links are in place. Um, but that they'll be coming up shortly. If you have news uh, about readings and stuff, send it to us or post it on the uh, Nebraska Presence Facebook page so that we can all keep up to date on what's going around. Nebraska Humanities has a list of maybe six or seven different workshops that are tied in, in some way or another to Nebraska Presence, either by the the poets um, who are giving the workshops. And I think there's going to be two by uh, Nebraska Presence poets. We're going to give one on uh, poetry, Nebraska poetry, and we're going to give one on uh, writing Nebraska poetry, because we've already heard from folks uh, that they want to meet with poets and learn how to do it. So um, I hope that works, and we'll have a volume two, uh, I guess, in a few years that we can celebrate it one point or another. Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks um, to Mojava for having us, and again, Rex for putting this all together. Thanks to all of you for coming from far off Omaha and Brownville and New York City. Um, I remember many years ago when Frank and I uh, went to a reading in, <clears throat> on Long Island and met a hometown girl, Teresa Savota, was reading there. We enjoyed her, read her, her reading and took her to the Long Island Railroad, and it was good to see her walk in today. Um, 
Um, a pod, not a podcast. That's what they are after their cast, isn't it? Anyway, uh, Friday Live tomorrow morning is going to have um, a short uh, interview of Greg and I about Nebraska Presence, how it came to be, who it might reach. Um, gosh, this feels like the Academy Awards, you know. <laughs> my speech even when I'm not nominated and this year um, everybody wins and it's just a wonderful feeling uh, to stand up here and look at it all of you it's just 10 years who would have thunk it um, I'll start off the reading with uh, I guess a poem of mine and a poem of Steve Hans who couldn't be here uh, he's in um, a place called Sweden, uh, but we claim him anyway. Uh, he was born and raised in the Berida Hills here, another Berida boy. Um, so I'm going to start by reading Red Barn, my poem, um, about a farm not too far from the Berida Hills. And I'm reading it because it's Greg who's uh, Kosmicki's favorite. Um, and since he can't be here, I want to be able to email him and tell him what he missed. <laughs> Red Barn. Maybe I should say for non-barn people. Um, they used to make barns in the 1800s with wooden pegs instead of nails. So the whole barn was put together, was all wood. There, there were no, well, later you pound it in a nail to hang up your milk buckets, but the barn itself was constructed completely of wood, and the farm that we lived on had a, a peg barn, and people would come by and see it. Um, go figure. I mean, we used it, but, um, but the barn took on more and more significance the longer I lived there and even after we moved away. Red barn. See the pegs there, I said, and pointed, and the insurance inspector looked. I can't remember what he said, but the wide side door of the barn had been rolled open and I could see two pegs holding a beam in place. The red barn color is a, is a particular red. My stepfather worked steadily every day of his life there, keeping up the barns. The barn, the corn crib, milk and cob houses, the cattle shed, the chicken coop, the lean-to. Later, he poured concrete where the manger had, manger had been, where I milked roni and later chocolate before school because he thought there was money in hogs. I hear cows stomp for flies, pigs squeal, and in the silence. If you want to insure the barn, he says, you'll have to nail over with corrugated tin. I look up past the loft, tight with bales with the warm, sweet smell of living things all around and the kitten and the barn cat, and the kitten the barn cat finally had, the one that survived, and the feeding bin full of oats where the chute was already worn smooth by the time I moved there, to where the owl sat every night like a stone column, his head cocked for field mice. And over there is where we rang the hogs and put the heifers for shelter starting January. The two plots of land side by side have passed to my brother and me, and we each live our own 100 miles away and rarely see each other. It's the land that keeps us in touch, and if we don't sell, that we will pass to our four children, who will remember their grandmother as an old woman. They will half remember the stories we force on them, and only then after we're dead and they have buried us. There is not corrugated tin enough to protect anything from weathering. No insurance with life benefits. The windows look to the east to let in light for the sows when they lay farrowing. Overlook the road that took me elsewhere and brought me back home again. Thank you. One of the um, reasons I read the poem too is because it's full of juxtaposition of time. Uh, present time, future time, and past time. And when you put together an anthology, um, nothing becomes uh, more central, it seems to me, when you're thinking about the poems as the past, the present, and the future of our state, of our land, because um, our land goes back longer than our state. Um, 
And then we'll go to one of Steve Hahn's poems, Snow on a Far Mountain. <clears throat> And he's really uh, meditating on a Japanese woodprint that he sees um, that reminds him of home. But the reminiscence of home is very deep in the poem. And I didn't get it if I hear it, but it, I have to read it, and it's there. It's interesting what he's done. The elderberries' blossoms will melt in summer, but now they pile in drifts reaching the top of that little jade mountain where an ant climbs in a coat lacquered black with rain. In classic Japanese woodcuts, one often meets a man, a poet perhaps, whom age is bent like elderberry branches. His cloak might be blue, tinged with the gray of some long reconciled sadness, and beyond him, beyond him glimmers turquoise sky same hue as a river far below from where he has walked, and his sash is heavy with dark berries printed on silk. The mountain on which he climbs is hummocked with snow in spite of the summer season, but it's unclear whether he is merely out for a morning stroll and is catching his breath, seeking nothing more than the yellow moss on that stone whether he shall ever stand on the peak and look back down at his life, or whether he will lie down in the shade that crosses his path like a bridge to rise again only as water. So that's from Steve. Again, thanks so much um, for participating, those of you who are in Nebraska Presence, and thanks to all of you for coming, and I look forward to a whole year of celebration and I raise the cup high. <laughs> Thank you. Since we're going in order on the list, next up is Shelley Clark Kaiser. Shelley. And from now on, I think I'll call the names out from down here. Otherwise, I'll be all worn out by the evening. <laughs> Thanks, Rex. And uh, congratulations, Eric Kay, and to you and Greg. What a wonderful surprise. <laughs> and uh, very well deserving. But thanks mostly for the way that this will bring poets together and uh, send them out into the different parts of the state to share poetry all around Nebraska. I think that's really exciting. Hopefully with students and citizens in small towns and cities and all over the state of Nebraska. So it's very exciting. And I know it's a lot of work. I worked on an anthology. So <laughs> congratulations and thanks for all your hard work. Tell Greg the same. First poem I'm going to read, if you've um, raised a teenager, if you are raising a teenager right now, or maybe in the future will be, this maybe poem will bring some truth for you. It's called My Daughter Picking Mulberries. That summer, watching you scamper up Martha's tree like a monkey, singing your little monkey song, I yelled, not too high. But already, at eight, you knew the secret of the climb. Now, you tell me you hate me, but I'm trying to keep count, and it's not more times than when you say you love me. Your body, the body of a woman, your breasts bounce a little in a skimpy black tank top, proclaiming in bright white letters Bastard Sons of Johnny Cash. <laughs> you don't wave back, running across the lawn to jump into a car driven by a boy straight out of reform school, and the other one, he's not even wearing a shirt. <laughs> the old junker sputters, coughs, peels off. I try to see if your arms and hands might be moving in the direction of a seatbelt. <laughs> Back then frightened, I yelled, come down, now. And you did, bucket of fruit, plump 
and bursting, your tiny hands bloomed flocks. And then I'm just going to turn uh, the page one over to a woman named Elizabeth Clark Bessel, who is also in her uh, slumber in the dark night of Sweden tonight. My daughter, Elizabeth, lives in Sweden. And so I guess we got a little Sweden thing going for a little while here. But her poem is called Asylum. The epigraph for the poem is from Reuters, the news agency. Reuters, I guess maybe you call it. And it says, Swedish investigators are baffled by a mysterious illness affecting over 400 children of asylum seekers, mostly from former Soviet and Yugoslav states, who fall into a deep depression and lose the will to live. Asylum. First, the children stopped speaking. No one noticed. Few understood their languages anyway. They stared at the window, but saw neither window nor sky, nor heard the voices of the other children laughing or sometimes crying, but rarely silent. At home, there were calls in the darkest hours of the night, whispered between fathers and mothers, with more to worry about than quiet children. When they stopped eating, mother took it personally. And now this, she said, you know better, she said. Eat when we had nothing. Think of when we had nothing. One day, they stopped moving and lay all day in bed. Water untouched, food uneaten. Mothers and fathers took them to a hospital. A needle forced them to live. People noticed they got a name. They faded into walls, into blankets, into the stale air around them. They disappeared into their own nothingness. They accused with their own nothingness. People could hardly stand to look at them. Those children who forgot everything. Those children who saw everything and then didn't. Thanks a lot. Charlene Neely. There you are. Every winter, my voice decides to do this disappearing act at random times, so I hope it lasts. <laughs> thank you, Rex, for promoting this and Mo Java. And thank you, Mary Kay, for being the instigator of it all. And all the wonderful people that had poems in here, I'm privileged to be part of them. And I have to put on my glasses. It's getting old. <laughs> The first poem I'm going to read is by Kathleen West. And Kathleen died this past July, so I thought I'd honor her by reading Progression. You are the farmer's daughter, corn-fed, apple-cheeked, a local yokel from a jerkwater town, where tractors cruise the gut on Main Street, and Loretta keeps tabs from the five and dime. You are the round little Swede, snub-nosed, tongue-tied, who rises at the crack of dawn to milk the cows, slop the hogs, and cut across the corn to school. You are the first to go to college, 100 homesick miles away, straw behind ear, manure on shoes, and a Coke date after the Kansas game, where Husky the corn cob yelled in your face. You marry the Hasey in ROTC blue, decide graduate school's not for you, pack sunbeam skillet and bake king tin to honeymoon at the Holiday Inn, where Tom and Sharon put cornflakes in the bed. Not the first to divorce, 
Grandma did, and she was good. <laughs> but Grandmother loved that city slicker, let him go straight to the dogs with corn liquor and settle down with an old country man. Your lovers are men who never remember if you're Iowa born or Dakota bred, but they've all hit I-80 on the way to Frisco, sent corny postcards from the Baselman's Cafe. God, but I miss you. God, but it's flat. You are the ugly American in jeans, t-shirts, and mirror shades. The dollar's strong, your accent's stronger. Cracking gum, munching popcorn, peanut butter, chocolate bars. Why can't the Europeans take us like we are? You are home again. Home again, wiser, of course. Fine, you practice like a salesman's spiel. The same old cornfield east of the house. Mom and dad on the stoop with the usual joke. Always glad to see you come. Always glad to see you go. <laughs> and this is my poem. I have no Swedes in my poem. <laughs> Unraveling. After the funeral, grandmother sat in her straight chair, methodically unraveling grandfather's favorite sweater, the pile of kinky, loose thread growing at her feet. Carefully undoing each stitch she had knit 30 years before, not breaking the thread, not even once, she let it drop in its own pattern, and her pile grew. She pulled the memories one by one, telling them as she went, recalling the days and loves of her life before laying them at her feet, a tale of yarn. When the last stitch was undone, the last memory told, without hesitation, she knew the time was right to pick up her needles and re-knit her life into a new form. The needles clicked loudly as she pulled the yarn from its pile at her feet and intertwined it into a covering of love for a baby who never knew his grandfather but will be protected by him still. Next on the list, Jan Chisholm Wright. Well, I can't tell you how thrilled I am um, twice now that, number one, I made half of my poem made it in the book. I was thrilled about that. And uh, after 10 years, it's now one book, one Nebraska. I mean, that is just so incredible um, and very timely. So I'm just thrilled about that. Um, I moved here from Houston, Texas about 20 years ago. Moved to a mile and a half north of Berida, population 25, if any of you are familiar with that. I didn't count. I was not in town. So that didn't even count. Um, but my husband, the, the area affected me so deeply after that move to be seven miles down a rock road uh, in the middle of cornfields or soybean fields, so far away from the big city and the tall buildings and, and uh, the fast pace of life there. And so I wrote this um, sitting on my front porch uh, in a porch swing of a hundred-year-old farmhouse in the middle of pretty much nowhere is what it felt like at the time. September 11th, a woodpecker hammers for his daily dinner. The horned owls in the bog have again begun to hoot. The crickets chirp with the self-same insistence. The corn stands still still ready for harvest. It occurs to me how easily 
this earth could do without us. And I can tell you this is not a poem that I would have ever written living in Houston with the big buildings all around me and the very definite possibility that that could have happened there, if not New York. So it's, um, it was um, a very interesting experience for me and talk about having a feeling or a sense of place and the way that that sense of place affects you in the way you view everything. And I feel so lucky that I got into this, and I feel so lucky that um, it's come it's come around. And uh, I and a friend of mine have put out a book called The Berta Hills of Nebraska, and it's been going around on exhibition. And it's it's about Berta or the hills around there. And so many people have said to me, "Oh, I know just what you mean." And that made me feel so good because I wasn't a native, but it affected me so deeply that even people who were native from that area say, oh, you really got it. And uh, it's very exciting. This is going to be, our exhibition will be at the Center for Great Plains Studies from July through October. And I'll get information out on that, so we're thrilled. And uh, it's just great to be in this book with all you famous people. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Twyla Hansen. All right, thank you. Wow, this is quite a crowd. It's amazing, Teresa. Thanks for being here from New York City. Yay. Um, yeah. Is anyone here going to read something of Don Welch's? Oh, yes. I am, too. <laughs> OK, so he's got several in here, but there's some of my favorites. I'll start with his Nebraska poem. This is a classic, Don Welch. Going west when the sun is going down, following the highways like light cords. If Nebraska were the name of a Russian woman, they could love her. There would be a certain large boned beauty about her. Or she would be dressed in black and lace. Her waist would be small. And she would drag her long dress over a floor into a study lined with French books. She would be a pawn in huge novels of war. As it is, she is a woman of spare beauty, turning away from him so that the fine hollows of her back were toward the bed. She said, why do you do this to me? Why do you keep imagining me in other places and states? And why do you keep assuming our children are unhappy? <laughs> I have a 9-11 poem in this book, too. But I thought I would read my, um, the title poem of one of my books. It's called Potato Soup. Back in, when I was a first a new writer, um, back in 1986, I went to a 10-day um, workshop up in Aspen, the Aspen Writers Workshop, with Kurt Brown and friends. It was an amazing uh, workshop with all these really kind of famous writers uh, were out there, and they weren't famous yet. And sort of like all of us in this room, you know? <laughs> um, but anyway, I had a writing, poetry writing workshop with Stephen Dunn. And he said, one of the things I'll never forget he said was, um, we were going to look at our poems, you know, they, we were all kind of new writers, and. In fact, one woman had uh, switched from a, a fiction workshop, uh, I forget who taught that, but the woman in the first day said, well, I can't teach you fiction. Nobody can teach anybody to write anything. So she came over to our writing, our, our poetry workshop. <laughs> it was great fun. And anyway, we had a good time, and I made some, 
friends in that group. We still are in contact with each other. But anyway, one thing Stephen Dunn said was, we're all sitting down with our little poems, and he said, okay, now we're going to think of these as fictions. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so here's my poem, Potato Soup. In the early years, she helped her mother plant peels, carry the dishpan out to the garden, digging holes. What you eat is what you plant, her mother always said, that edible tuber common as dirt, a near daily staple. One grandmother left potato country long ago for this one. Another immigrated for the promise of more potato land. As she learned to cook, she began peeling alone at the sink, sticking a spare slice on her tongue, smell of starch lingering on her fingers. Mashed, fried, baked on Sundays for hours, regular as pulsating winds over the plains. Soon graduating to French fries and sizzling grease to fermented spirits of the potato. Beginning with a certain look and an eye, relying on folklore, that time of month safe if planted at night under the expansive and unblinking moon. Grappling into the soil around roots to sneak an eager potato or two. She's fond of the skin color, the flesh, textures, exotic flavors. Moving on to potato salad years, quick boiled varieties from the hot tub. Decades here and gone, potato love constant. By now she's concluded it's best on gradual simmer, consolation accompanying maturity. In the afternoon, she sautes onion and butter, stirs in flour and milk, chops celery, carrots, adds chicken stock. She thinks of the hour when they'll be eating into twilight, of the hour of the long night ahead in front of the fire. Should she throw in something extra for tang, for play, a measure of Chardonnay? All her life, she thinks, it has come down to this, bringing the bottle up slow to meet her lips. Now we have Teresa Boda. Borrow someone's anthology for a second. How? Um, I'm delighted to be here. This is a wonderful group, and I'm so happy to be part of Nebraska. You know, when you go off into the big city, you're anonymous. It's wonderful, <laughs> but then you want an identity in the rest of the world, and it's here. Now let's see. Where am I? Um, I. Unfortunately, probably can't stay to the very end because I have come to visit my 93-year-old father and I have to put him to bed. Now, that said, what happened to me? Ah, here we go. Uh, my dad and I spent a reasonable amount of time at the sale barn in Ogallala. All the cows with barcode on their backs get run through. The wind like a big pneumonia across all that hide. Then all the reds sell high. The sold song of a two-way radio. You hear that cut by the fence. Ears that cold. Well, impossible to repress this fever of selling. Well, nigh impossible. The free puppies go free. How do we total up? The inarticulate gestulate. It's not hard. It's as hard as ice in shade. One finger up, then trucks, then the butcher. <laughs> you know, you make a mistake and you've got four heifers. <laughs> so uh, this is Bones for Dad starting to show such a sad thing to sense dad's sadness is made up of sense, as in I sense, not know. 
not a pregnancy, no, the opposite. In the dictionary, sadness is derived from salt, the sifting from the chest bone to where the eye watches, no longer feeling clever, a sting, such a sadness, the brick of it. Like love, you're stuck on its thrust and wane, you can't give up. Dad's not going to make it. The it being, you can't watch and you must, but you don't. You feel the past, the sad, with regret, close enough. Dad says, hi, one more time. All the bulbs in your gift grew strange. Hi, he says again. Becky Faber. Well, I do need to tell you that um, for the past few years, I have been the chair of the One Book, One Nebraska Committee. So in full disclosure, there is no conflict of interest, okay? <laughs> the nomination was made through the regular nomination uh, format, and it went forward. Um, it was voted on by the board. It won fair and square. I did not pay anyone <laughs> any extra money, but we all reap the benefit from uh, this book having been chosen. I will say that uh, the board of directors was extremely excited about this selection, and as Greg and Mary Kay know, they are fully committed to promote it throughout the state in 2018. So I'm hoping that many of you uh, who have availability will be contacted at different times to help promote this anthology because it's wonderful and I would go so far, Mary Kay, as to say it's groundbreaking. So. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read two poems, and the first one makes a reference, a political reference. And as Mary Kay said, this was published in 2007. And so the prompt for the political reference was <coughs> Uh, the weapons of mass destruction and whether or not Iraq had the weapons of mass destruction and what Dick Cheney was saying to the press at that particular time. It's entitled My Sister. My sister takes six baths a day, not in a warm tub of scented salts or prolific bubbles, but in tepid water. She tells me that she is learning to swim, something she feels she must do before visiting either coast. She says that ignorance is not bliss. My sister chooses only friends whose first name begins with A. Anne, Angie, Andy, Alan, Anthony, never Tony. She says that she can only handle one letter at a time, and that these people understand the concept of linear sequence and how first things must come first. My sister always carries a photograph of the president in her purse. She says that she admires his ability to lie, how Pavlov has trained him to slobber untruths on a daily basis. My sister says that life is easy to understand, that the rest of us complicate it with delusions and distractions and deconstructions. My sister says to start at the beginning, be willing to admit what you don't know and always know the enemy. My sister wears a watch on each wrist one with a Mickey Mouse face, and the other with the face of Jesus. They are set for different time zones. 
Either way, she says, time is not. And Therese, I have to say what you read just makes me miss my dad so much. Um, he was a farmer. I grew up about 150 miles east of here, across the river in that other state, and uh, have lived in Nebraska most of my life. And this poem comes from a visit to the Northeast, and it's entitled, The Fisherman's Wife. She waits tables at the Bayview Cafe, demystifying the contents of seafood chowder for tourists. She tells me that her husband is a fisherman, asks where I am from, sighs, and says that she has never been west of Boston. She cannot imagine middle America, a place without coastline, a place where people eat beef daily. Each time she moves from table to kitchen, I notice a different tattoo. Legs and arms twirling in color like a globe. On long winter evenings, I will eat chowder from a can. The main fisherman with red cracked fingers will trace each tattoo. The fisherman's wife will close her eyes and tell him that he is all of the world that she needs. Thank you. Rosemary Zump. This is a, oh, wow, it's strange to hear your voice this way. <laughs> it's like I'm in my own head. This is a called Remembrance. It is a series of short vignettes. What is the color of Remembrance? What shape's a glove when I slip it from my hand? In my closet, old moccasins slumped under a gold Hindi dress, grandmother's Czechoslovakian gave Yishniani folded on the shelf, statue of a Ghana queen, green frog beaded on her forehead, Quan Yin, carved from a stump of bloodwood, curled oak leaf stained alizarin by the sun, blood running hungry to Ellis Island, bronze woman, I won't dream my mother's girlhood dreams suffused in the sweet bruised fumes of bananas, of crates, crates of bananas handed out at your feet. Refugee, expatriate, exile, emigre, let us bow our heads. Weep for the roses that have lost their petals. Mourning spreads over burial grounds, incinerated mounds, bleached indigenous bones scattered under desiccated pine needles, trained dogs nosing into the past, touching adjacent fields. I sleep on haunted embankments, flames, burning, torch blooming candelabra of the skyline, I shine a flashlight into the back of the cupboard, scumble through dust for a lost box of Cheerios. Forgotten milk waits like forgiveness in the refrigerator. Where is comfort? Aroma of baked colache and strudel, caraway seed and sauerkraut, wild mushrooms in Cuba, warm round loaves of rye bread, crusted folds of skin over skin, spreading fingers, thumbs sheathed in leather, tan creases, lifelines create the palm of the land, names loom from tattered nights and overlapping waves of oceans, bright immutable womb. Um, right one. 
This is called wiping the slate clean. Rub the eraser, large as a bar of soap, across each failed poem, over drafts of letters never sent, not honed to perfection. Erase the dried stalks of broken friendships and old betrayals shriveling and crumb crumbling, shriveled and crumb cluttering the sidewalks. Erase every burnt dinner. Erase each pan with blackened eggs merged with metal. Erase the weeds from the yard. Erase the tears. Erase the water flooding up the Missouri. Scrub the soft erasers, thinning body on every seeping wound, scab, and ache. Let the rubbings tumble around your feet like a mass of narrow gray worms. Gather the worms in your hands like manna. Notice how, even now, they hold the smell of corn silk, the golden strands we strip off and toss into the trash. I want to thank Mary Kay and uh, Greg. Um, sorry he's not here for the great honor of being a part of this anthology. It was just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. Um, and hey, 218 Library Book of the Year, right? That's super. So, wow. Anyway, um, just a little preface. Um, this poem has nothing to do with Nebraska or Nebraska topography or even Nebraska people. Um, <laughs> it has no real sense of place and the usual <laughs> meaning of the word. So anyway, it's called Death and Company. Well, I have been through all this and it is not my fault with my face growing smaller and smaller in the mirror and my eyes like red hornets. It is terrible. I was still a child. And now with the wind raising her dirty skirts, my blood ticking time to the north, I remember that white house on Sailor Street, watching the dump tr trucks with my grandmother, who was dying in a rest home. Oh, they are all dying, my friends. Tom Pate, long and lanky, a sharp thud on a Canadian football helmet. Mike McCarthy, the rags of the priesthood ground his slumping shoulders. Marilyn Morrill, face mashed against the dashboard. Tom Bisbee, decapitated on an icy night in December by a derailed train. And I sit in this dark apartment and weep, testimonies of salt for a lost shadow in a room full of shadows until morning climbs down from her apple tree like a friendly child to follow death, a face familiar in the crowd. Thank you. What do you think of the night so far? Is this fantastic or why? We're going to take about a seven or eight minute break. You know, that means 10. Everyone knows that means 10, but seven or eight officially. This gives you a chance to maybe get another refill of something that you might want to drink or try something new. I really do appreciate Paul Marshall and his crew here. Mojava has been our home for almost two years now for this particular reading series and a home for musicians from all over the area. So this is the kind of place that we support. And this is the kind of community that we love. Mingle, meet some people, renew some acquaintances, uh, start some new ones, and uh, have fun. Be back in uh, seven or eight minutes. Wink, wink. Okay, welcome back to part two. Glad you all could be here. They'll hear me in a minute. I have more amperage than any one person. Maybe even any more than three people, I'm not sure. Thank you all for being here and, and helping out Mojava. Maybe we'll set a record on the number of gallons of coffee, tea, etc. that go down the hatch tonight. 
That would be fine with me. We like to set those kinds of records. Uh, the happy talk going on, people doing dances. I see multicolored devices flying through the air. And uh, that's pretty interesting. Things break out when you get a bunch of poets together and they come up with, with ideas. And there's one, my friend, Master Todd Robinson from Omata. He's full of ideas. If, I'm not if in the book. He's not in the book. He's not in the book. That's okay. There's room in part two. There'll be a section two or volume two coming up someday. Maybe you can be in volume two. We hope so. As I said, we're very glad to have you here tonight. This is a great celebration. Um, I'll introduce the second half of the night by saying that Marilyn has been a poet I've listened to for years and she's the master of the small exquisite jewel box of a poem so when you open the lid something pops up and dances and a song plays and what can you say more about a poem than that i can't marilyn will read some marilyn come on up You can just tilt it's that down. Great to be here. You can tilt that down um, a little bit. I grew up on a farm with all sorts of uh, creatures, and I've always loved nature. And I'd like to begin by reading a poem by James McGorian, who I understand is not here this evening, but is in this book, called Crickets. They call our names in the night, inviting us into the middle air where the wolf chews stars to pulp, paws of stone resting on the empty dream. As we approach, the crickets retreat, their song ringing like scars. We pass the pumpkins rocking on vines, the barn running, its arms full of boards. Beyond the creek tattooed with minnows is the oracle of flung seeds the staked earth between glass trees, the ferns blackjacked from behind. The raccoon opens a suitcase of bees. The fox nudges the rabbit into the transept. Roped with berries, the bear stands upright, turns on a pegged leg, admonishing, and departs with all our memories. The piety of terror padding the walls of the clearing. As quail lift in blank escape, fence posts put steel shots in their pockets, and everything shimmers. The tear shell room where laughter is born, the sulfur lockets where love is stored, the voyage of mercies and melt cry, the witch breath balance of body, where the deaths on both sides of our life are even. Where the years of pain given and received are brushed with the oil of the moon. Under the sapphire window, the cat curls on the slope of the cellar door. They call our names in the night and leap and scurry above bandaged straw. The last rumpus of the season, the float of this crooked month in the marrow of the unsaid year. And this is my poem, Dawn Watch. In depth of quiet water, an old fish feels its way up toward the morning, pushing darkness away with its fins. Its blue nose, nothing but a bow of spun satin, resting for one moment on the thin line water makes on air. Bruce Cobart. You're about there in 308 area code. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Rex, thanks for pointing me out so I can come up here. And thanks for putting this whole this whole down together. Appreciate it. 
thank you very much, Mary Kay and uh, Greg, for allowing me in. And it's felt like I got to eat, sit with the cool kids for once. <laughs> <laughs> um, this poem, uh, Army of One, came from, uh, actually started off on a cocktail napkin. And it was because there was a pretty obnoxious uh, recruiting commercial that used to be out the, during the time of the of the Iraq invasion. So there was this guy in the bar that was kind of resembled Tommy Wiseau with blonde hair. It was protesting the Iraq war and it was kind of getting on my nerves. And I thought, well, let's do one from the point of view of somebody who's seen something. So this is called Army One. I am an army of one. I go where you don't want to go, and I clean up the mess as caused in the name of your comfort. I make less than minimum wage, and I operate on less than minimum sleep. I don't get a hide in an undisclosed location. I only have hot and stinky body armor between me and 120 pissed off people who want their lights back on in 120 degree heat as I pack 120 pounds of gear to lug around because I'm in somebody else's home not my own. I'm an army of one. I'm the Captain Willard and Colonel Kurtz inside every 19-year-old American and my methods are unsound. I should be in class now, but I got orders to make the world safe for spring break. My ass is chafed, my body armor smells like a giant shoe, and we're down to one MRE a day, so back off. I'm surrounded by some kids who take soccer balls that we hand out and some kids who drive trucks at our checkpoint and then laugh at us when we lock and load on them as they turn away at the last second. I can't tell which is which. They don't want me here and I don't want me here. I want to be stateside. I want air conditioning. I want cold beer and a hot shower. I'm an army of one. I have nothing to say to you when I get back because you won't understand or care. When I get back, you won't want me there because I'll remind you of something that you'd rather forget. I guess the next reader is Chicken Pesto Club. Otherwise known as Terry Lee Schiffern's Terry Lee. It's a strange way we earn our nicknames. Yes, it is. Forever known now as Chicken Club Terry Lee Schifferns. <laughs> um, this is my poem from the book called When They Go about my dog Thelma, who is legendary in our parts. Thelma was a recovering cat killer at one time and ended up, she was a Roddy, a Rottweiler, <clears throat> with, but still just a big bear. She ended up with her own black cat that she nursed and uh, for months people, the, the psychologist from UNK came in and said, Terry, you're animals. They need, they need counseling. <laughs> I said, yeah, probably. She also had her own deer, a pet deer that she also nursed and took care of and taught to um, run under fences instead of over fences. But this is her poem called When They Go. My dog Thelma taught her pup how to sit for biscuits and chew on sticks and bark at the coyotes in the distance and chase the cars that came down our lane. Today, Thelma sits on the ridge next to the windmill, looking out towards the river as if on guard or watch, just a couple of feet from where I buried her half-grown pup last week. And I wonder, I wonder if dogs feel remorse or regret. Inside, my oldest son has picked my cupboards clean. The green tea I bought at the specialty store, gone. And this morning, I couldn't find a washcloth to save my life, like the toothpaste and shampoo and pins and that part of my life that I will never get back. They have gone away to college. And what I should have and shouldn't have said on my son's first night home when he drank and he drove through the neighbor's fence plays over again and again in my head. But what can a mother know? I dug the hole deep, knowing if I didn't, Thelma would dig her daughter up and I'd have to bury her again. 
I call Thelma from her lookout to come inside where I will give her a biscuit and we will go on. Oh. And if you will indulge me, I would like to um, toilet read the Nebraska poem by Don Welch. And I would like to follow up with Ted Couser's poem. So this is Nebraska. Um, the year he was, uh, when he was the poet laureate of the United States, we followed him around and told him we were going to get t-shirts that said Ted, Ted Head, Ted Heads. We, we had our own groupie group. And so, yes. <laughs> so this is his poem called, So This is Nebraska by Ted Couser. The gravel road rides with a slow gallop over the fields, the telephone lines streaming behind its billow of dust full of the sparks of red-winged blackbirds. On either side, those dear old ladies, the loosening barns, their little windows dulled by cataracts of hay and cobwebs, hide broken tractors under their skirts. So this is Nebraska. A Sunday afternoon, July, driving along with your head, hand out, squeezing the air. A meadow lark waiting on every post. Behind a shelter belt of cedars, top deep in hollyhocks, pollen, and bees, a pickup kicks off its fenders off and settles back to read the clouds. You feel like that. You feel like letting your tires go flat. Like letting mice build a nest in your muffler. Like being no more than a truck in the woods. Clucking with chickens or sticky with honey or holding a skinny old man in your lap while he watches the road waiting for someone to wave to. You feel like waving. You feel like stopping the car and dancing around on the road. You wave instead and leave your hand out gliding lark-like over the wheat, over the houses. Thank you. Kelly Madigan. I am thrilled to be here and I I told somebody during the break, I'm, I'm just billowing up with affection for all of you people and all the connections in the room and the different ways that I know people. I officially became a resident of, what did Becky call it? That other state on Friday. So I got my Iowa driver's license Woo! and registered to vote. Yay! Kind of excited about being an Iowa voter. And, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's nice to be in Nebraska tonight and be with you. One of the poems that I have in this book came from a conversation with a poet friend of mine who is no longer with us, who many of you knew, Deb Walls. And Deb had told me that her first husband, who she was only very briefly married to, I think it was a husband, um, and had no contact with for many years, and she was happily married to her second husband, that she had heard that he was dying. And she was really surprised by what it brought up in her. And in that, I found this poem. 25 years later, she learns her ex is dying. Five nights in succession, she recalled him in dreams. His voice was a series of clicks and whistles, the sound of Burlington Northern Santa Fe troubling the long rails. If she starts to walk those tracks, her cupboard doors will spill their store of crackers and oats onto the floor. Her shingles slip from the sure grasp of the roof. Linoleum plans to stall her. The dog knows to sigh and paw the water bowl. Her climbing rose has been positioning itself all summer. Still, she remembers herself as a sundress, waving from a makeshift clothesline on the fire escape of a red brick building, or as a banner of blonde hair advertising from the back of a black motorcycle. She wants to take up cigarettes again, sleepwalk, lose both shoes at a party in a neighboring town. 
She wants to tell him something or sing a chorus of that old Donovan song to him, maybe just over the phone. She remembers shuffling the tarot cards, intuiting a future much more wondrous than the thud of news on her narrow porch, the civil greetings penned to college friends. She wants something old, something stolen. She wants to balance on that rail as though she were not an owner of things, as though the train were due as though everything still mattered. Thank you. Thank you so much. I miss Deb, and I think that she would love to be here tonight. I'd also like to read a poem by Nancy McClerio. Um, I admit that I don't know how to pronounce the name of the author that is quoted in this poem, so bear with me. Um, Nancy McCleary, also no longer with us, also a person who was uh, very dear to me, who would have enjoyed this evening very much. Girl Talk Lists. Now that she's back, I visited her in her studio and she asked me, what you reading? I showed her the list of elegant things in Sai Shonigan's pillow book, Come Down to Us from 10th Century Japan. And she said, I work from my own list. Those things that look beautiful in sunlight, snow falling, and tiny blue flowers on the rosemary in my east kitchen window, and shadows of clouds floating on the river over fields, green winter wheat, a rainstorm, the single tear in my buddy Fred's left eye just before he died of AIDS, and through a sunny window, a meadow of snow that no animal, nobody, not even me, had ever stepped into. And any of my sunlit paintings will fit in with my impressionistic washes, my visions. So what's on your list, she asked. Told her, maybe I'd write from her list. <laughs> and I add, sounds and smells, morning doves calling at dawn the fragrance of mock orange in bloom, ambulance sirens, soft wind over wheat fields, spicy smells off the river, and my mother coming out of the bathroom laughing and saying, it doesn't smell like roses in there, <laughs> and the jingle of my telephone voices of my adult son or daughter, my two granddaughters or friends on the other end, sun and moon eclipses my two brothers. She picked up her brushes. I walked into the bright afternoon humming. Matthew Mason. Thanks, Rex, for doing these things for years and years and keeping things going. Um, that's fantastic, and we're grateful. Um, Sarah, my wife, is not able to be here tonight. There's a sick child at our house, and I won, so. <laughs> a poem by Fred Jettick. Um, Fred is a poet who I really like. I got to spend a fair amount of time with him. Just He published a chapbook of mine. And so when I met him, um, you know, it was just kind of fun to talk poetry with him. And you know, I'd, I'd published like 50 poems at the time and felt you know, good about myself. And I talked to him, I was like, so Fred, how many poems have you published? Well, at this point, about 5,000 <laughs> under like three pseudonyms. And I'm like, oh my god, because I wasn't aware of certain things about him. So um, it's fantastic. But he passed away uh, not too long ago. So I wanted to make sure and, and read a poem of his. There's a poem called Father Dancing. My father liked to dance alone late at night when he was sure the rest of the house was sleeping. He would turn on the old Philco and dance with the broom. One summer when mother sent me out with his lunch, 
I caught him doing the rumba in the berry patch. <laughs> Music seemed to come from his pores. One winter, he waited, he waltzed for the cows. I went to the barn to feed the cats. I found him doing a perfect pirouette. His arms spun out and up until he was like a giant top spinning before the stalls. The cows were lowing into their cuds. I could tell they'd seen it all before. <laughs> Occasionally, he would spin to a stop, bow, kiss one of them right on the nose, and two-step back into his turning. One day, I caught him dancing nude in the small meadow down past our creek. He and the dance were as exquisite as prayer. I thought of Noah's sons covering their father's nakedness and wondered why. <laughs> And of course, the problem is you read one of your favorite, you know, you read a favorite poem before you read your own. Should have read mine first. <laughs> so now it's like, uh, yeah, that, that poem is all right, but I got to look up that Jetic guy. So, um, but this is my poem, which I'm so happy was put in here. Um, it is definitely a Nebraska poem. is written on a drive from Denver to Omaha, um, where my sister was driving, and. For like 150 miles, uh, we followed this minivan with a bumper sticker that said, tell the good news about Jesus. <laughs> so for like 150 miles, I'm just staring at this, <laughs> thinking, well, what would I tell? So I started a poem on the drive. <laughs> so the good news. Jesus lent me 10 bucks when I forgot my wallet at lunch. Sure, he could have ordered a chicken pesto sandwich and broke it into two full minutes. It's actually in uh, I should have come up earlier. Um, and broke it into two full meals, but he's no show off. That's what I like about Jesus. Jesus listens to cool music. If it weren't for Jesus, I never, never would have known about Tom Waits or Ani DeFranco, and I sure wouldn't own any Lyle Lovett CDs. <laughs> but Jesus makes a kick-ass mixtape. Jesus loves cows, thinks my poems with cows in them are a hoot, and encourages me to look at herds of white cows in a green field and imagine salvation is underneath each windmill. Jesus tells me Pat Robertson is right, and so is Al Sharpton. That they're both wrong, too, but that's not the point. His point is how God is sewn into every fabric, even yourselves, even Elvis. Jesus saves, and Jesus recycles. <laughs> Jesus eats fish for more than omega-3 fatty acids, drinks red wine for more reasons than his sacred heart. Jesus doesn't dress like the medieval paintings with the gold hats and the Mr. T rosaries. Sure, he can clean up nice, but Jesus likes blue jeans. Jesus makes a killer Chianti, but he refuses to turn water into Diet Coke for me. <laughs> What's the difference, he asks. <laughs> Jesus pisses me off with his honesty sometimes. But it's not like he's ever wrong. <laughs> Jesus acts real serious when someone rushes up to him hollering, Jesus, take me up to heaven. I will see you in the kingdom, Jesus. Jesus says they should get their kumbaya yas off by putting on some overalls and hammering in the morning. <laughs> May as well make heaven bigger, not just your egos. Jesus digs the how does Jesus eat M&Ms joke. <laughs> Poem needs a visual aid. <laughs> Churchgoers explain it to everybody else. It's fairly obvious. Uh, how, does <laughs> how does Jesus eat Eminem's joke? He won't do it at a party, but he did do it once when just the two of us were watching cartoons. Jesus wanted me to tell you he loves you. Jesus also wants me you to stop doing that 
thing. <laughs> Jesus tells me I'm saved. Then he laughs real loud. <laughs> I hate it when Jesus does that. <laughs> Rich Wyatt! <laughs> right you heard me. <laughs> it's okay if I read two more of my shirts, sure. isn't it? Sure. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to read. Uh, Two poems, uh, one by uh, Cliff Mason and one by John McKernan. Uh, John McKernan, I'm very familiar with, uh, I, I guess. Uh, I first uh, read him, I suppose, in the New Yorker back in 1976. Uh, it's the only poem I've ever seen of his in the New Yorker, but within a couple of months of that, he was also appearing in The Atlantic at the time. It was called The Atlantic Monthly. and and. Uh, John McKernan, uh, perhaps as uh, in the case with uh, people like Greg Kuzma and Ted Kuzier, uh, has published uh, uh, just about everywhere, from Paris Review to Partisan Review, any, any big hot-ass magazine you've ever heard of, John McKernan has had a poem there. So I'd like to read a poem of his, one of the, uh, it looks like three he has here. And then a short one uh, by Cliff Mason called The Old Crow. And I like this, I guess, because uh, it speaks to sort of the where we are now in the middle of winter and it's cold and so forth. Uh, and it also reflects uh, the ancient Chinese insistence on uh, the change of seasons and, and each season presenting a particular set of emotional responses and uh, and practically no one has ever really presented emotion in, in a, a more refined and, and uh, 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 powerful uh, way. I didn't quite have come up with the right word but maybe the poem will save me. The Old Crow. Even in full moonlight I cannot see the old crow in the tree at night, head tucked under a wing, yet I know it is there a blackness robed in blackness. It's supposed to warm up. <laughs> this one by John McKernan is from a checkbook uh, he uh, published uh, with Lost Roads Press uh, out of Arkansas. And I think it may still be uh, going, I don't know whether strong, but I think occasionally it does publish books. Uh, this is called Walking Along the Missouri River North of Omaha, I Find an Indian Arrowhead. The man who carried the first Bible into Nebraska scoffed at the grass ten feet tall, called the blue sky a liar, named the distance where nothing and a further nothing beyond blooms and evasion. This lack, this absence, the man with the book could not contend with, a land where man had never cursed life, Job is still hearing the first footprint on the west bank of the Missouri River. Year by year, growing deafer, dumber, he hears the whir of the arrow on its way to the heart of the deer. Thank you so much. Carol Barnes Montgomery. <laughs> Yes, that one. I wasn't paying attention. You may have to pull that mic down a little bit. Pull it down? Just to, just to match your, your, your mouth. That'll work fine. We've got Brad. He can do it. So you break some little footwork here? Yeah. Is that better? Or is that okay? That's good. Okay. Thank you to everybody who made this possible tonight. I have been away from the poetry scene for, I'm guessing, 15 years, maybe something like that. So it was a, an honor to be in Nebraska Presence. And thanks to all those who put that together. And uh, it's so good to see people tonight uh, that I haven't seen in a long time. Just had a birthday in December. 
and uh, I'm not the person I used to be. I went to the library the other day and I had my glasses like this and uh, I said to him, you'll have to read that for me. I didn't bring my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> he just looked at me and, uh, I, and then I realized I got home and looked in the mirror. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, my poem in this uh, Nebraska presence is uh, titled, entitled, Any Particular Joy. Dolly never married Tom. She meant to, but there were too many miles between them. When her son was born, she named him Tom. She meant to marry the man who fathered him, but again, too many miles. And there was the old dad to contend with, him and his ill humor and his bent mind, his cattle, land, horses, feeding sleds in the winter, hay racks in the summer, and the endless waving grasses carpeting the distance. The milk pails, wash tubs, prairie fires, they kept a woman busy so that when her hair thinned and the old man died and young Tom went away to Chicago, she counted the years on her fingers and came up with none that she remembered with any particular joy. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Carol. Amy Plutner. I think that's good. That should be good. Um, I'm really happy to be alive in this community of writers and people that are creative and out tonight. So thank you to everybody. It's a great place to be. I'm going to take Matt's advice and start out with my own poems, so I'm not disappointed. <laughs> and um, I, I will do this. This is just a poem I wrote when I went back to visit my parents. It's called Morning. Mom tells me to write about the largest cottonwood in Platte County, the one along Shell Creek's bank in the middle of Sawfield's cornfield, or write about Grammy's pink comb dipped into a glass of water. But I'd rather write about my mother in her blue robe with the patio door slid open to cool spring grass. She smiles, looks over her shoulder at me, do you hear them? And in comes song, filtered by thick cedar, a low, soothed rhythm of soft sand before waking. The morning doves conversing down on my mother, making her face shine as if her own mother's voice called, Alice, Alice Marie, Alice Marie. I'm going to go over here. There we go. And Marge Sizer could not be here tonight, and she asked me to read one of her poems for her that's in the book. I think she has three of them in there. And the one I chose is a poem that I heard her read at open mics fairly early on, and I related to it immediately because I also have sisters that sometimes, like, one of my sisters is here, so her and I kind of get things a little bit the same way, but my other sister, I swear, did not grow up in the same household <laughs> or with the same parents, and we are all from the same mom and dad. So anyway, this, this poem of Marge's is called Paradise on the Niobrara by Marge Sizer. The beef and potatoes on her plate match the beef and potatoes on mine. Her hands and face, the dog licked, same as mine. Someone brushed her hair, brushed mine. Blizzard after blizzard, we shrugged into dark coats and ratty boots and walked into the tedious cold. Same this, same that, she tells me today, but everything different, just the same. You call that loving, she says. That was crazy making. That was crap. 
You were always looking at the skyline, singing with the chorus. I had a solo. I flew in close to the hip bones of the buildings, my stomach empty, my fists like rocks. That's March. <laughs>